but it's never gone well. Oh, really? Really suffering in my dreams. I actually quit the piano for two years. Are we able to <laughs> answer this question in my lifetime? I don't know. Welcome to the third episode of the Open Scores Conversation Podcast. I hope you're having a beautiful day as you tune into this episode. Today, we have a fantastic powerhouse of a guest, Maya Perdue. This Tokyo-born young artist has traveled and toured in Japan and Europe. She continues her studies and her career as a classical pianist in Salzburg, Austria. If Maya is not dutifully perfecting her craft in the practice room, then she is honing her skills in painting, video producing and editing, building her social media presence, and running her own weekly radio show. It is honestly amazing how capable she is. Today, Maya and I discuss the responsibility, determination, dedication, and respect towards classical music in order to have the audacity to live and breathe being a classical pianist. If you would like to support this channel and see the extended version of this podcast, please head over to my Patreon. I hope you enjoy. It seems that visualization is a really big part of your routine in order to prepare for like competitions mm-hmm. or recordings and things. Was this something that you, a teacher had uh, taught you or is this something you just naturally did? Well, I'm sure that some teachers said this to me, but I learned more from making mis- mistakes or fails. So there have been so many concerts that I go on stage and I'm like completely freaking out. <laughs> and... Then I I really sat down and said, okay, what are the things that I'm doing now? And what are the things that I could do, but I'm not doing? Either I just didn't notice them or I'm being lazy not to do them. And one of them was like, if you have the opportunity to see what the place looks like, look at it and like just have it in your head because then you can be slightly more prepared. But it, it really came from trauma, I think. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of yeah. things come from trauma. <laughs> when you had that one bad performance. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I will play mm-hmm. it through in my head before I go to sleep. Mm-hmm. So that way when I go to bed, um, my brain can organize everything in the morning. It's usually better mm-hmm. memorized. Do you do any visualization before you sleep? Yeah, definitely. I have a few scores like all around my bedroom that I just put it on the wall so that when I I do exactly what you're saying now, I go through it with my head without being in front of the piano. Uh, but there are definitely moments that I'm like, oh shit, uh, what happened in the left hand here? And so that I don't have to get out of bed and look through my score, I just have it like on the wall. Yeah. I have a question. When you go through it, do you like let yourself play a little bit like on with your hands like on your lap or anywhere or do are you completely still is it just i mean like physically yeah like not at the piano but like when you're lying down you can kind of move your hands it really depends on what i'm trying to practice and what i'm trying to sense Mm -hmm. if i'm trying to get a deeper like body connection then i try to not Mm -hmm. rely on my fingers tapping Mm -hmm. but if i'm trying to like memorize a fingering then yeah or Mm -hmm. like a certain touch or something and i want to practice it on my lap then yeah i will do that Mm -hmm. what about yourself um i i consider like moving my fingers cheating because then like i can usually remember everything so um, I, I try to be very still. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Does that mean, this is like totally not music related, but just a curious question. Does that mean yeah. you sleep on your back? Yes. <laughs> yes, I'm a back sleeper too. <laughs> be- <laughs> partly because of this reason, because you can't not visualize and practice if you're on your side, you know? Yeah, true. This I definitely even thought about. I thought you like caught me with something. You're like, do you sleep on your bed? <laughs> is this is like the epitome of like living and breathing and sleeping, like being a musician? <laughs> gotta sleep on your back. <laughs> I gotta practice in your sleep. Is that's how you get your forty hours a day? True. True. Speaking of which, that I know we're still like on this topic of practicing, but have mm-hmm. you ever practiced? in your sleep like in your oh, dreaming yeah. state mm-hmm. but it's never gone well like I'm oh really always, yeah, yeah i'm really suffering in my dreams when i'm <laughs> i'm so sorry to hear that i'm glad your real life you're not suffering as much <laughs> yeah <laughs> i would rather no i don't know though 
suffering in your dreams is like another level of unpleasantness in my opinion. You're just trying to re-traumatize yourself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like if I wake up and I'm like, I'm gonna practice now. <laughs> You're like, oh no, I can't mess up that shoe, man. I gotta practice. I, I have this question a lot asking how do you keep your old repertoire fresh and this is also really helpful the thing is even when i'm practicing a totally another piece if i get tired i just decide to play something like completely different once like something from a really old and then i'm like oh damn it i cannot play it anymore <laughs> and then like, I, I it makes me really productive because i have to come back to the piece i'm practicing now but I want to get that over as quickly as possible because I know that that piece I tried out now is not playable. So <laughs> it's like, then I do that and I put it in and then I play it. And then it's like, you have really um, various practice, um, how do you say, the, the minutes. So some pieces I practice for 60 minutes and then there's a piece that I practice for two minutes with a timer on and then next I have 30 minutes, 15. And when the, there's a lot of variation, I think you're also way more productive and that's something I really make sure that I'm the most productive, pra uh, pra the most productive I can okay, this I don't know how to say this, but <laughs> something on the line of that, yeah. Yeah, I love that you touched upon two things. One of them being that sometimes you can stick to a certain piece or a section for so long that you get past the point where more repetitions are aren't gonna make it any better. It actually might make it mm. worse. And so having that variety and keeping the brain nice and fresh can really help with that. And the second mm. thing that I really like that you touched upon is as professionals, we don't just play a piece once and then have it in our hands for the rest of mm. our lives. Like we yeah. are human. So it's good for students mm. to have the realism of like, yes, we do forget things. There are some, mm. you know, we go back and we're like, it's not playable at all. And I have to semi relearn mm. this. Yeah, we go through mm. our cycles of pieces and we do rotations, especially if we know what programs that we're doing. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And I'm sure that there are students out there or um, young professionals that are looking to study around the world with their music. Mm -hmm. um, and I know you studied in different places in both Japan and also in Europe. You're um, in Austria right mm -hmm. now. Can you describe how your experience in learning music was like in Japan and in Europe and any mm -hmm. differences or similarities? In Europe, you self-manage yourself. And this means that you, in a way, can put down your own path. Um, what you're especially interested in, what kind of music, what era of music, or even solo and chamber music, or if it's corepetition, uh, this is accompaniment. Um, you have many options and you have to, in a way, it's also difficult because you have to find your passion and really do it in a way that other people haven't done it yet. But in Japan, um, for me, I think it was really cool because I got trained really well in Tokyo and then I came to Europe and what I mean by training is that for example about the repertoire in Europe I haven't really been told um, you have to play this and this and this but in Japan there was a curriculum for all the students that you should play such and such many Bach piece and then the whole Chopin etudes and then four Beethoven sonatas and this and that. And there wasn't a lot of freedom to choose what you want to do. But at the same time, this trains you to be able to do everything you are supposed to do as a classical pianist, I would say. Mm -hmm. But the art of being a classical muse, uh, m pianist has changed so much and I don't think there's one way for everybody so if you learn how to do certain things really well it helps but at the end of the day you're not going to be a student forever you have to get out of this and decide for yourself what you want to do I like the atmosphere in Europe now that people mm -hmm. are very eager to do something that makes them happy. 
and that's not a mindset that I had in Japan. It was more, I know what I should be doing and I will do this. And about what I want was not the biggest of importance. Um, I don't want to like <laughs> compare and like put like Japan really down, like, <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's a difficult comparison for me. Also, as I said at the beginning, I've changed so much. One thing that I really like that you mentioned is like, at some point when you're studying, you're going to be a student. But then mm -hmm. sooner or later, you have to get out into the professional world. Yeah. For you, what are your philosophies that define yourself, that you would categorize yourself or someone else as a professional musician? What are your philosophies mm -hmm. as a professional and towards the music as well? For the musician themselves, I think responsibility and also the fact that you're not no longer only playing for yourself. I think this is a mindset I am particularly keen on having when I go on stage, that I'm fully aware that this performance is not for my own sake and that I have a certain responsibility and expectation um, on being on this stage now and I am willing to fulfill that. In a way, you're kind of not only in service of the music, but also to the audience. I think so, definitely. With the music too, it, I think the main point for me is the um, two possibility that music is for yourself and the, the music is speaking for itself. And then playing for yourself and playing for whatever other purpose there is. And I think as a professional, you always have to be on this side at least when you are on stage. If you're alone having a nice evening, you can of course play for yourself. But for example, if, if you do that and people really like it and they're listening from the window on the other side of the street, um, I would still not call this a professional performance. What to you um, or the characteristics or approach defines mm. playing for yourself and playing for mm. an audience? Playing for myself, I would not necessarily be so precise to the music. I might improvise and have a lot of freedom in terms of the dynamics, color, the time I use for each phrase. And also, I probably wouldn't pursue from the beginning of the piece till the end, like with the same intensity. But on the other hand, at the performance, that is my responsibility. So I will do that, definitely. Mm -hmm. So when you're playing in service of the audience, what do you expect that the audience is wanting to get out of your musical performance? Is it an uh, emotional cathartic experience? Is it some profound mm. experience or just enjoyment? Mm. Well, well, that's the thing. That's something that we cannot know. And even if they say something, um, I think there's so much going in a human's mind and brain. They're both. Maybe in their head, they, they understand that this is like a cultural experience, but maybe inside they they had a horrible day and they just want to feel a bit better. It, it could be totally different. It could be something even more intense. Um, and I think that's the thing. Even if we think we know it, we can. And it's, it's like, um, who said this? Socrates, I think. The most, the best knowledge is that you don't know anything or something like this. <laughs> I'll, I'll put a and... clip, I'll put the quote up. <laughs> <laughs> I'll fact check you. <laughs> and, and this is why the music has to speak for itself. Because once we start considering each person's motive, my motive of the performer, the motives of the audience, some people are going to be able to understand it, relate to it more than others. Some people are going to like it and it's it's just going to be super scattered um, out. And 
I think what is so amazing about music is that this would happen with everything else. But with music, it can really unite. People can have a, an experience together. And to do so, us on the side of being on stage have to be very, very professional and understand that we cannot know what the audience want. Yeah, I completely agree with you with the idea as like as a professional, you have a certain responsibility to prepare the music up to a certain level so that you can open up that space mm -hmm. in order mm -hmm. to have that communal experience, whatever that might be, mm -hmm. because it really is next level when you know when you're playing and you might be manipulating their emotions or that they're just with you with that crescendo or they're just with you at that very last moment you release and everyone in the hall is just mm -hmm. quiet because they just want to enjoy what is remaining of the experience that to me is mm -hmm. very powerful and one of the one of my favorite reasons why i like performing i don't know about you <laughs> why do you like performing why do you play music for <laughs> are we able to answer this question in my lifetime i don't know i'm sure it'll change as you grow up and you have your relationship Definitely. with music mm -hmm. Wow, I, it's something I don't have to have a reason for. This is an easy way to get out of it. <laughs> it's easy and profound, it's great. <laughs> <laughs> and then one thing that I really like that you mentioned is that we also have this responsibility to the score to do oh, the okay. music and let it speak for itself. I know that a mm -hmm. lot of people come from different approaches with music where like you are mm -hmm. a conduit to the music, you are a messenger, or you should put a little personality into the music. Mm -hmm. And we've mm -hmm. had many conversations about um, how you feel about you and the relationship with the mm -hmm. music. Could you go in a little more deeply about that? How? What is the role for yourself as a musician playing music and the responsibility to the score? Well, actually, I had a really interesting experience about a month ago. Um, I was talking with some non-musicians, um, actually very young. I think they were around 15, 16. And they asked me, why are you, are you satisfied with people just knowing you for music that other people have written wouldn't you like to compose yourself like where is you in them and i i really thought about it i felt like um actually offended at that moment because i thought this is what i do and why questioning that um but then i know that when i get a bit offended or maybe angry it means that some of it is probably true and this is why I'm getting offended so I thought about it and the thing is I don't want to compose really so much I, I would a bit um, and I don't want to put anything there because I really totally believe that this music classical music and the repertoire there and this mentality here should stay beyond my lifetime and i would like to carry this to the next generation and this is because the history is so rich we have had so many people carrying this specific type of music up until now because there have been people who understand the importance of it. When you also understand that, it's so absolute. I think it's something that can stay and I, w I would like to be part of the process of keeping such things. Yeah. As I talk to you more and more, I find that you have this feeling of a lot of discipline and responsibility mm. towards classical music. Mm. Where do you think that feeling comes from? Was this something since you were a child or maybe all of your training has ingrained that in you? The word discipline that you use is something um, a lot of people use to describe me. So it's probably also a personality trait that I have. The first reason would be that I really respect music 
um, especially classical music and the way that it's been preserved up until now and the people that have taught me until now, people that I, I have seen closely pursuing a career as a classical musician, everybody that I've met, I have so much respect towards. And I think it is classical music that is growing these people and growing me and everybody in this kind of way. And I think that's something that should be taken care of and at the same time um, somehow preserving this is a rebellious act for me um, because now everything in this society as, as far as I'm seeing is trying to um, trying to destroy the old and make everything new it's even more interesting when you have something to compare from a hundred and six hundred years ago and say these are the differences and this is why it's so new. And I think it's very arrogant to think that everything created closer to now is better. I I don't know. I I feel like not a lot of people understand this and I feel slightly irresponsible to I mean I don't think I can do much but if I understand it in this way I there is a reason there is enough of a reason to try I think. Yeah, there is there is value in preserving history and especially great art at that or else we wouldn't have all these music mu museums we wouldn't have all these museums <laughs> and and the culture that has shown how music or art has developed and our human history which i think is also very important so your responsibility your duty and your discipline towards classical music um, I think it's very admirable. Do you think that you have other characteristics or skills that have helped you be a successful musician? I think I'm becoming more and more open-minded compared to, for example, when I studied in Tokyo. I was very much within my box and bubble that other people created for me. And now that I've left my home so many kilometers away here living alone, the experience of encountering something you never thought that's possible really s pushes the boundaries of your openness. And I'm very lucky to have had many experiences like this and I feel very open to, to many things. And I think that leads to courage too, to try out um, many things, new things, even going to places because um, there is of course the beauty of being in one place but there is so much more to do you can meet so many more new people and also being open has allowed me to accept criticism also I've always been able to accept criticism but I was very bad at um, accepting compliments uh, and I think this I'm better at now and I think when you accept compliments, it enhances your growth speed because you say, yes, I can do that. So let's do the next thing. And if you don't accept it, even though you can do this much, you're always practicing for this much. And this is a waste of time. So. I think every musician out there hears you on the idea that it's difficult <laughs> for us to accept compliments. <laughs> Yeah. because we spend like, so much time true, yeah. yeah we spend so much time just self-critiquing and then we mm. have once a week or twice a week lessons to be critiqued mm, you know so true, when you get yeah. a compliment it's it's not like oh wow i'm being complimented for the first time it's like uh. are you sure about that because x y and c <laughs> yeah. true i also really love your idea of being open-minded mm -hmm. so I know you're developing professionally you're a young artist what is your thoughts on pursuing 
I guess, a professional career that is outside the, of the box in the sense that social media mm. nowadays has opened up a lot more opportunities. People are, mm. artists are being able to be signed with very big name companies because mm-hmm. of their Instagram profile or TikTok. What is your thoughts and feelings towards that? First of all, I think it's a very good thing because there were always probably a lot of talented people that got never discovered because of the exposure this is not something new we just see it in a bigger mess because of social media and the thing is with social media now i i don't really want to say if you're not good enough but the thing is there is a certain standard that we have been preserving, not even me, just the people behind our generation, before our generation, preserving that probably the mass amount of people on social media cannot quite judge. And the fact that now numbers is the judgment Um, How much of that is relevant is another question. Yeah, it is really difficult to be able to filter through the noise because there's so many Mm -hmm. different people of different levels who are going to have their opinion on your own career, the music Mm -hmm. that you're producing. So while it opens up a lot of opportunities for professionals, I think it also opens up a lot of opportunities for troll comments or invaluable mm-hmm. comments, or also valuable comments too, and you can create a community. But I think it's just mm-hmm. opened up a playing mm-hmm. field that it's almost like the Wild West, like anything can happen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I think it also brings a lot of tension between, at least for us young musicians, there are those who are more interested in being on social media they are more conservative people and there are people who absolutely hate this or there are people who would like to be successful on social media but don't really quite know how to do this and str- and all of us um end up entering the same competition or end up aiming for the same thing because as a classical musician i think there is quite a narrow path of success in in a i don't know how to say it, like an old school way traditional in like the traditional way yeah in a traditional way it's it's very narrow there's specific competitions you want to win or there's specific achievements you want to do um and i understand the struggle because i myself i am doing social media and so on but i still have this image of what I want to be as a classical musician of those who grew up with no social media. Like I I absolutely love Zimmerman and I'm sure Zimmerman doesn't do TikTok. So maybe, (laughs) I don't think so. So, I think he'd be very reluctant if he had to. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Because I know you're like a long-term plan type of girl. What is your <laughs> ultimate goal, do you think, that you see yourself maybe 10 years mm-hmm. from now? I've always said my goal is to live, have a living of just playing the piano. That I am self-sufficient and also I'm willing and I would like to just play the piano for the rest of my life. This is This has been... My goal because it doesn't necessarily just mean I'm gonna do everything it takes to be on stage every day no like then probably in a few years I'm burn out burnt out and I don't want to do it anymore but it has to be that I still have the joy and I I feel the magic of music but yet I also don't have to do anything else to in order to survive because i don't know i feel like i learned this quite a lot from my mother because um she kind of quit being a stage like a pianist um when she had me and she is teaching now 
and she's a really amazing teacher. I was so lucky to have her as my first guide. I felt how eager she was for me to be on stage because she enjoyed it so much and she wants me to feel that happiness too and she wants me to be successful and I learned that just doing that is not easy that you you have to really be dedicated and work hard in order to have the choice to just play the piano what does it take to be a classical musician who performs for their lifetime and wants a career like yours where you just want to be able to enjoy the magic of music and never give that up and and live in that space what characteristics of the person would it take what do you think is that one thing that would help them hold on through all the struggles and difficulties that come along with this career. I mean, there's good things with this career too, not not <laughs> saying about that. There's a wonderful things, but it's also a very mm-hmm. tough career. Do you think they need that foundation? What what foundation? Oh, you have to be a 4-year-old prodigy going to Curtis oh. in order to have this career. No, no, I don't think this is necessary. Um of course it might give you a head start, but you have to live it. And this is what's difficult. I think you have to be determined that you have any kind of reason. It can be anything, but something that you're not going to let down within yourself. You you have to keep wanting it. This is this is what's difficult because some days you don't want it as much or um, some phases you you're not interested or or whatever but this this cannot happen i think with this kind of profession and it has to be beyond a daily or a monthly thing it has to be that you are sure in 10 20 years you still want it and you know this you also have to have i would say the courage and the audacity like i do right now to say i want it in 10 20 years but really of course you can start saying like how would you know that you might be a different person you might have a family or whatever but if if you can't say it i don't think you can do it i think it's very true in a way one's relationship with music is a lot like a marriage (laughs) Not to put pressure on aspiring really? young young people, but in the sense where, um, like you mentioned that there are days where you want it more and there are days where you want it less. There are days where you look at your partner and you're like, I love you. And there are days where you're like, you piss me off. But it's that choice of love. It is that choice of, I love music, I love the craft, I just love playing, or whatever it is, whatever that thing that you said that you need to hold on to, you you make that disciplined choice to say, hey, I know it sucks, but I'm going to show up. I'm going to show up for me, I'm going to show up for the music, and I'm going to show up for whatever it is that I feel that I want to fight for. And I think that's what gives yeah. people the audacity to say, yeah, I'm going to do it for the next 10 to 20 years. Yeah, yeah. And... You know, it's funny because I actually quit the piano for two years. When I was 15 till 17, I didn't ever touch the keyboard. I never played anything um, because, like I said before, my mother is also a pianist. And I just thought, hey, am I really doing this because I want to do it? Or am I just doing it because it's it was the first thing i saw when i came out of <laughs> no but like <laughs> you just birthed and there was like a piano there and you're like that's my <laughs> that's life <a> piano. <laughs> <laughs> but i mean it's really cool to have a parent that is a musician but it's also a lot of pressure if they really want you to pursue this and this was in my case this way I was not um, a child prodigy or anything, um, you know, even in like, I went to like a normal, like not 
a music school but a normal studying school and there was an annual festival where you sing as one class and I always auditioned to play the piano background for this and I never got the place like never <laughs> they did you dirty <laughs> <laughs> not really I was like practicing and then I show up and they're like yeah you you don't really like go along with the singing because I was like soloing <laughs> you were like, first and foremost a soloist <laughs> when you were young <laughs> Yeah, and anyways, so um, I also just thought, oh, damn, I, I'm not good <laughs> enough to do this as a profession. <laughs> yeah, and also have to do it, not just for, for myself, but also for the people who let me choose this. Because they could have been like, Maya, no, like, cut it out, <laughs> like, don't do it. But they were like, okay, if you decided, do it. And... I feel very thankful and also responsible towards this. The, and just, I, I feel not a pressure anymore, but just like, I, I gotta do this for, for everyone. Yeah, it's so arrogant when I put it like, I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think so at all. Thank you so much for doing this podcast with me. I have, as we both know, tons of questions that I want to ask you, but I know you're yeah. super busy. You have to get back to practicing. <laughs> so hopefully we'll be able to do one of these again. Um, thank you for sharing about your experience and all your words of wisdom. So for all those people out there, it's okay if you feel like you're having this love-hate relationship with music. I've gone through it. Maya's gone through it. There are times where you're going to question whether you're good enough or... Um, whether you need to take a break and sometimes for as you can see with Maya and also for myself sometimes you need to take that break so you can come back refreshed and anew and bring more to your music and level up and it's totally okay so if you're struggling with that you got this such a <laughs> thank you so much this was really a lot of fun I don't know how much like I don't think I gave any advice it just shared honestly how i am and how i feel like and i also feel really motivated by saying this because yeah i don't know i feel refreshed again and i remember how i felt Wonderful. <laughs> back in the days yeah thank you again for your time thank you too see you soon see you soon